This case attempts to place the Vietnam War within the broader context of the Cold War, and more specifically, within the context of the long struggle that was waged by various different means between the Soviet Union and the United States in the Third World for powder, power and influence. So I'm going to begin with a couple of remarks about different fronts in the Cold War with the help of this first of a series of maps which is going to illustrate uh, what we are looking at today. Uh, I'll be explaining the legend in just a moment. Uh, most of it isn't on the map yet. I would argue that there were really three fronts in the Cold War, and I'm going to discuss them in the order in which they became significant, roughly. And the first front, I would suggest, was here in Europe and here in Asia, that is, where the Soviet and American armies actually met at the end of the Second World War, and including the territory that they had occupied during the Second World War, and which they then turned into their core alliance. Uh, that was the first front. Uh, as it happens, it is the one that gets the least attention in these two weeks we're spending on the Cold War, but I'm sure it will come up. The second front, you could argue, uh, began to develop in earnest in 1949 when the Soviets exploded a nuclear bomb. And that was the strategic nuclear front on which we both spent enormous amounts of money and eventually deployed about 10,000 warheads. But fortunately for us all, that one always remained uh, simply a matter of war by algebra. Uh, you will uh, do some serious analysis and thinking about that front next week. And lastly, there was this enormous front in the third world that occupied so many of the headlines of the nation's newspapers uh, from the 50s through the 80s, and which reached its climax, at least from the American point of view, in the war in Vietnam. So there was a struggle, sometimes involving war, in the third world. And what kind of a war was it? Well. As always, I like to return to Clausewitz. And clearly, going back to this slide, it was the second type, not the first. That is, we were not going to defeat decisively the Soviet Union uh, in the Third World. It is interesting that both sides, I think, made a credible case throughout the Cold War that they would treat an attack on the first front, that is, on the territory they had occupied in the Second World War, like an attack on their homeland, and thus that that would lead to an all-out war. And thus, that front, too, remained quiet, despite some very, very tense moments in Berlin and one limited war in Korea. But uh, in the Third World, there was not going to be a decisive victory, but there were endless opportunities, as we will see, for this kind of grabbing territory to hold for presumed strategic advantage and waiting for the peace negotiations, which came only, as it turned out, after communism had collapsed. Now, let me say a few words about why the Third World was such a battle, battleground from a historical point of view. Well, first of all, its political status was up for grabs, much of it, because of decolonization. Uh, much of this territory that we'll be talking about had been part of European empires, and almost all the European empires ceased to exist in the 20 years or so after the Second World War. Secondly, for various reasons, Marxism and Marxist-Leninism had a kind of intuitive appeal to a number of people in the Third World. Lenin, as you know very well from last week, had, after all, defined imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism, and he counted on revolts of subject peoples to help bring capitalism down. In addition, many of these territories were poor. Many of them had been exploited by U European colonial powers. So there was a natural constituency for Marxism-Leninism, even though that certainly didn't in, uh, extend to the entire populations of these areas by any means. And lastly, as you've learned in the past week, Marxism-Leninism is an extremely powerful organizational tool for seizing power in a chaotic situation brought about by a change of regime, civil war, major war, or what have you. And the China case was only the first 
in, uh, of a series in which such events gave communists an opportunity. On the other side, meanwhile, the United States, in the wake of the Second World War, was equally convinced that our version of democracy and capitalism was the wave of the future and the model which the rest of the world should try to follow. And we felt every bit as much as the Soviets that we were pointing the way to the future, and you will find that in the rhetoric of any Cold War president at one time or another. And indeed, by 1960, there was clearly a perception that there was a worldwide struggle going on between two ideologies, two ways of life, and frequently it was suggested that the future of the world was going to depend on what happened in the third world. And this leads me to the analogy which also hang, hangs over this case in many ways. The analogy with our first case of Athens and Sparta. They too were competing for power and influence in practically their whole known world and in many different city-states. And there too, in each city-state, almost each city-state, as you will call, almost every one, there was a democratic party which tended to ally with Athens and an aristocratic party that tended to ally with Sparta in the same way that in so many new nations in the Cold War you could find pro-communist and pro-American elements contending for power and calling on their patrons for help. This kind of situation is extremely unstable because domestic conflicts have regional and even global implications and they are so treated as the Vietnam War was. Uh, <clears throat> and thus, um, events can acquire a significance all out of proportion to their actual size. Thus, bringing it to the Cold War context and from the American perspective, one could always argue, and many did, that any time there was a leftist regime in Iran, say, or a revolution in Indochina, or a conflict in the Middle East, the US and the Soviets were bound to become involved, and more often than not, they did. And the question is, why? Well, again, we can go back to the Greeks and to the classic statement of this problem by the Athenians in the debate in Sparta, arguing, first of all, that it was perfectly natural for a power like them to acquire an empire, and that they were compelled to defend it by fear, honor, and interest. And fear, honor, and interest come up a lot in modern contexts in this course, and they're going to come up today in this lecture. They provide an almost automatic justification for intervening almost anywhere that there is a conflict. But the whole point of strategy and policy started, may I remind you, by Admiral Stansfield Turner in the immediate wake of the Vietnam War, is that those kinds of reflexes aren't enough. That any intervention has to be carefully thought, off, thought out, that the policy objectives have to be weighed against the costs, that one has to make a net assessment and decide whether appropriate strategies are available. And there were American policymakers throughout this policy process that understood this. And one is one of the greatest of all American strategists, General Marshall, who made this statement, testifying against large-scale military aid for nationalist China in 1948. You can find a four version in the Truman Administration in China Reader, which you got last week, although we didn't assign this particular passage. Marshall is saying, in effect, we can't intervene anywhere. We have to pick the places and the methods which are most advantageous to us, and we can't afford to feel that, in effect, we have to win them all. And what I'm going to be looking at from now on, over six decades, is the extent to which various American administrations, five decades, uh, did or did not uh, follow Marshall's strictures and made intelligent decisions. Lastly, to help navigate our way through this, I have made this list of a menu of strategies, both offensive and defensive, which the United States used at one time or another uh, in the third world. Let me run through it quickly. Defensive strategies, in other words, how do we hold on to territory that we regard as within our orbit? Well, we can simply 
assist them in state building or counterinsurgency without intervening. We could do what I call preventive regime change. In other words, the government there is friendly to us, but it isn't doing very well, and we're afraid it's going to follow the communists, so we'll get a new one. Or we could, as we did in Vietnam, resort to full-scale war. We also had offensive strategies designed to bring unfriendly territory into our camp. And those included military coups, uh, usually carried out by the CIA. Sometimes it was simply a matter of diplomatic breakthrough. Uh, a few well-chosen words in a state visit can turn a friend, an enemy into a friend. Sometimes it was support for an insurgency against an unfriendly power. Uh, Full-scale war was a rarely used option in uh, offensive strategies, but it was there. And lastly, uh, there was the option of political and economic isolation. So basically, as I go from the Truman through the Reagan administrations, we're looking at the mix of these strategies which each one used. So let us begin with the Truman administration. And here uh, we have our first uh, map showing what is going on. And I'll take this opportunity to talk about the legend. The, legend. Uh, the dark red uh, represents the Soviet bloc itself. The dark blue represents what we call the free world, that is, the nations with a close relationship to the United States. Now, already in 1950, uh, we have a third color, uh, this orange, uh, which is Yugoslavia at that point, representing a communist nation which has broken away from the Soviet orbit. Uh, and we have other uh, kinds of regimes as well. Uh, you can barely see Guatemala there, which is pink, indicating a leftist regime, democratically elected in that case, not communist, but probably some sort of Marxist and not very friendly to American business. Uh, later, we will see a lot of U.S. clients, uh, again, not formal allies like NATO, uh, in light blue. Uh, we will see Soviet clients in purple, again, non-communist but friendly. And lastly, we have uh, this for armed conflict. Gray means neutral. By the end of this lecture, you may also feel that gray means lucky enough to have been left out of all this for the whole 50 years. Okay, now, the Truman administration was most focused on the first front I mentioned, and particularly in Europe, and then, of necessity, on Korea. And that's where it was putting its money, its interest, and its effort. But it had some decisions to make in the third world. One was the decision not to intervene in the civil war in China, which had led to a communist victory, as you know. Meanwhile, uh, there was war going on in Indochina, as you will read about, uh, between uh, the Viet Minh under Ho and the French. In 1950, and actually before the Korean War, we decided, for a mix of reasons, as you will see, to assist the French financially in fighting Ho. The British were fighting an insurgency uh, in Malaya, but uh, for the most part, the Truman administration wasn't focused on the Third World. Uh, however, the decision not to intervene in China, the communist victory, and then the Korean War was a political disaster for the Truman administration, as you already have learned, uh, whether you think it was a good decision or not. Uh, this raised an enormous Republican human cry uh, over the loss of China, as we'll see in a minute, and it certainly contributed something to the unpopularity of Truman and the Democratic Party by 1952. And uh, the, thus, the Eisenhower administration came in with a different focus, a different perspective, and uh, much more of an interest in the third world. Now, one of the dynamics driving this whole process during the Cold War was the dynamic of American politics. The Second World War had given us a feeling of responsibility for the whole world, uh, the Republicans were now exploiting this. Here is then-Senator Richard Nixon, the vice presidential candidate, explaining that the Truman administration has lost 100 million people a year to communism since 1946. The vast majority of those people, of course, were Chinese, and that therefore, obviously, it was a failure. Indeed, uh, Nixon and Eisenhower and John Foster Dulles, no, not Eisenhower, I beg your pardon, I don't think he did, but uh, campaigned in 1952 on the idea that containment was a sterile and inadequate policy and it was necessary to go beyond containment to roll back. 
And two years, and uh, the year after he was elected, and with respect to Indochina, uh, okay, uh, we'll get to that in a moment, sorry. Uh, Eisenhower coined the famous metaphor, which was going to play such a role in the um, um, subsequent history of all this, the domino theory. Uh, the idea that if Indochina fell, this is referring again to the war against the French, uh, that other dominoes would fall and that it would be impossible to keep them up. Now, I put the link on the slide, which of course you'll be able to see after the lecture. And it was worthwhile to go to the link because he elaborated on this at length then uh, and elaborated on each of his three points, and it is uh, very interesting. But uh, there was, uh, under Eisenhower, at the same time, a reluctance to undertake serious large-scale military adventures. Eisenhower did, as you know, reach the armistice in Korea. Uh, and in 1954, when the issue of intervention to help the French came up, he rejected it. Uh, the American people simply were not about to get into another major conflict in Asia one year after the end of the Korean War. And indeed, that's another dynamic that holds the, uh, that, that affects this whole process. Uh, once we have gone through one of these major interventions, uh, there is at least a 10 or 15 year window in which it's very unlikely that there's going to be another one again and we appear to be uh, beginning uh, one of those windows again right now. Um, okay. Now, let's look at the situation in 1953 where there were a number of new problems popping up around the world to deal with. Again, the war here is continuing in Indochina, in Malaya, and there's also an insurgency in part of the Philippines. There's this leftist regime in Guatemala and there is a somewhat leftist government in Iran, which is giving, uh, in particular, British Petroleum a good deal of trouble and uh, alarming the U.S. because it might be playing footsie a little bit with the small Iranian Communist Party, but uh, it certainly wasn't a communist regime itself. Uh, but the Eisenhower administration decided to face all this with some new offensive strategies in the Third World. The first offensive strategy was the strategy of isolation and non-recognition, which the Eisenhower administration applied not only to China, which they refused to recognize as a legitimate government, communist China, but also after 1954 to North Vietnam. They would not give diplomatic recognition to Ho Chi Minh. We would not sign the Geneva Accords that gave him some legitimacy, although we promised to uh, agree with him. Dulles seemed to take the position that if we expressed our moral disapproval in this way, in the long run, it would have a political effect. Uh, but the Eisenhower administration developed a new weapon, or implemented a new weapon, CIA covert action, uh, to bring down unfriendly governments and also to foment civil wars. The leftist regime in Iran was brought down by a British-American coup, really, involving street demonstrations and alliance with Iranian military officers in 1953. In 1954, the leftist regime in Guatemala was replaced by military rule uh, in the same way, uh, helped by a very small bombing raid mounted in a neighboring country. Uh, it didn't take much to topple that regime. So those two dominoes had gone onto our side. That was not all. Uh, jumping ahead, to 1958, uh, we see that in Indonesia, where there's a leftist regime under President Sukarno, uh, the CIA has started a civil war, which didn't go very far in Sumatra, to try to get Sumatra to break away. And in addition, they started a guerrilla action in Tibet after the Chinese uh, took over uh, in Tibet. We don't know very much about that one, uh, but it went on for a while. Uh, there were uh, other things, um, okay. Now, meanwhile, uh, as a result of the crisis in the Middle East, Egypt and Syria had become Soviet clients as they were to remain uh, for some time and that certainly was a setback for us. Okay, if we go two years later to 1960, an election year, we see more trouble. Uh, the Congo, newly independent, is in the mix, midst of a civil war. 
uh, in which one of the contenders for power, Patrice Lumumba, is certainly a Marxist. Uh, and above all, Cuba has been seized by Fidel Castro, who clearly now is a communist. Uh, in addition, uh, there is a civil war in Laos, where in a pro-American uh, regime had, had been maneuvered out of power in 1960, and clearly the insurgency is heating up in South Vietnam. Uh, so things aren't going out all, uh, aren't all going our way by any means. Now, for China, I had to invent at this point a new color scheme uh, because the situation is rather complicated. Uh, China, by 1960, was clearly, to any calm, informed observer, not an ally of the Soviet Union anymore. They were already waging a bitter propaganda campaign. And in fact, Mao was accusing Khrushchev of having gone soft and of appeasing the West. However, the United States policymakers were not capable of absorbing that. And we were still treating China as an enemy uh, and as, uh, indeed, uh, some sort of part of the Soviet bloc. Uh, even though the evidence was mounting, that that was not true. Now, what was the Eisenhower administration doing? Um, uh, okay, the Eisenhower administration was reacting to these changes with covert action as well, and this was the great era, it turned out, of CIA assassination plots. Uh, one was mounted against Lumumba, the leftist leader in the Congo. He was actually assassinated in early January 1961, uh, although it seems that he was not assassinated by the people the CIA had hired to do it, but by other people. In 1959 and 60, they, in 1960, they also mounted a major effort to assassinate Fidel Castro. And to do so, the CIA enlisted several leaders of American organized crime who had had major interests in casinos in Havana that they had now lost. At the same time, they were preparing the Bay of Pigs invasion, training about 1,500 Cuban exiles, who were, at some point, going to land in Cuba to try to overthrow Cuba. And they had also started a preventive counterinsurgency uh, project. Uh, the Dominican Republic had been ruled for a couple of decades by Rafael Trujillo, a very brutal right-wing dictator. Uh, it was thought that this was providing a, an opportunity for communists, and thus there was an assassination plot mounted against Trujillo as well. Meanwhile, um, yes, defensively, the Eisenhower administration was, as you know, uh, trying to help South Vietnam um, and uh, providing it various kinds of aid, which enabled Ziem to maintain himself. An advisory group in the Philippines had helped to put down the Huck Rebellion. Uh, we had reached a defense treaty with Taiwan, which was now part of the American uh, sphere. And Dulles also uh, pursued what was called Pactomania, uh, signing up anybody he could for loose alliances against communist expansion. In Southeast Asia, we had CEDO, uh, including Thailand, uh, including the Philippines, including Australia, New Zealand, a couple of European powers, and promising to defend South Vietnam, although South Vietnam couldn't join it. But this wasn't a formal ironclad alliance like NATO. Uh, in uh, Central Asia, we had CENTO, or what was called the Baghdad Pact, including Turkey, uh, originally Iraq, Iran, which was now an American client under the Shah, and Pakistan. Uh, unfortunately, it had to be renamed uh, after 1958, I'm sorry, uh, when, going back to 1960, when the Iraqi uh, government was overthrown and ceased to be an American ally, although it took some time for it to be a Soviet client. Now, there's one other thing I have to mention about the Eisenhower administration, which relates uh, to this issue of Pactomania and so on. Uh, as I say, they did not undertake any large-scale military action against communism because they didn't have to. But they planned to. They planned to, in great detail, laying down policies saying that we would defend just about any territory in the world if it was threatened by communist aggression. And how would we defend it? Mainly with the use of tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, Eisenhower was a deficit hawk. He had cut the size of the army. Uh, and he liked the idea of relying on our technological edge. And this is why uh, Kennedy, when he came into office, as I discovered writing a book on this, uh, was confronted immediately with all sorts of proposals to intervene in South Vietnam and in Laos, 
uh, based on the idea that if there was escalation by communist power, North Vietnam or China, we would immediately resort to nuclear weapons. So even though uh, those plans were not implemented, they were an important uh, legacy. Okay, we turn now to the Kennedy administration, which uh, pursued somewhat different policies. Kennedy, like his opponent Richard Nixon, was a shrewd politician. Uh, now that the Republicans had been in power for eight years and certain territories had gone communist, he wasn't going to pass up that opportunity either. And this captures the spirit of the 1960 campaign although uh, it is a question posed at a debate, not a statement by Kennedy himself. In other words, well, Mr. Nixon, in 1952, you blamed the Democrats for the loss of China. Should we now be blaming you for the loss of Cuba, which might not be as big as China, but it's a hell of a lot closer and therefore a source of concern. Uh, and Kennedy took a, whole, a hard line on a lot of Cold War issues, actually on, on the strategic nuclear front as well in the campaign. But he went in a different direction when he came in, in certain respects. And in particular, he began using diplomacy as an active weapon to try to draw certain nations from the uh, leftist or neutralist camp into the American camp. Indeed, I think that in my lifetime, the most effective dip diplomats in the White House, and certainly the ones who spent the most time on diplomacy and enjoyed it the most, were uh, Kennedy and Bush won. Kennedy, first of all, wanted to show that he sympathized with the aspirations of the third world. Uh, he remarked uh, to his wife, as I have recently learned, that the most important ambassadors were now in the third world, uh, where the battleground was. And he immediately made it clear uh, that neutralism, which Dulles had violently opposed, was now okay. And he cultivated not only neutralists like Nehru in India, but even the more leftist Sukarno in Indonesia. Uh, he also uh, made a gesture towards Nkrumah uh, in Ghana, uh, a leftist who had actually been educated in the United States and also toward the government of Guinea. Uh, meanwhile, there was a leftist elected government in Brazil under Goulart, uh, and Kennedy was trying to live with that government as well. Kennedy didn't live long enough for a lot of this to bear fruit, but it was a very serious matter. And for instance, he was going to visit Indonesia in 1964 if he had lived. However, uh, he believed in sticks as well as carrots, and he continued covert action uh, on, on some fronts. Uh, Kennedy carried out the Bay of Pigs invasion with some reservations, which of course turned out disastrously because Castro was well established and wasn't going to be toppled by 1,500 men. But he remained absolutely committed to overthrowing Castro through covert action. And in fact, that effort was continuing uh, even right up to the eve of Kennedy's own death, uh, even though it was supposed to be interrupted, uh, according to some interpretations, after the missile crisis. Uh, it was not. Uh, he also organized, the CIA also organized a successful covert campaign in British Guiana, of all places, uh, which had elected a Marxist uh, as its first leader. And the idea of another avowed Marxist in Latin America uh, was enough to terrorize Washington, and he was removed. That one was kept off the front pages. Uh, I was about as well informed, informed a teenager as you could find in those days probably because I was living overseas, but I had no idea about any of all that until many years later. Um, okay, and he was trying uh, to live with Goulard in Brazil, as I mentioned. Okay, meanwhile in the Congo, uh, we continued our covert effort. Uh, Lumumba was already dead, but eventually we uh, succeeded in getting General Mobutu in, into power, and he became a client of ours for several decades. So those were offensive strategies. What about defensive strategies under Kennedy? Well, help for friendly governments was pushed on a lot of fronts. Uh, one was the Alliance for Progress, an effort to promote both economic development and democracy all over Latin America, uh, where Kennedy also traveled uh, several times. And the United States helped many Latin American nations practice 
what I call preventive counterinsurgency, that is strengthening their intel, their police forces, and so on, so that many possible insurgencies in various parts of Latin America never got big enough for us to hear about. This is very important. Uh, for some years, I've been promulgating Kaiser's Law, which states that by the time you're reading about an insurgency on the front page of the New York Times, it's probably too late to think about eliminating it altogether. But many of the uh, ones in South, Africa never got, in South America never got nearly that far, uh, and that is a characteristic of uh, success. Um, okay. Now, meanwhile, with respect to Indochina, Kennedy, as I have said, was immediately confronted with a whole host of proposals for the, from the bureaucracy in 1961 uh, to intervene both in Laos and South Vietnam. And against the almost unanimous advice of his senior advisors, he would not do so. Um, he received this piece of friendly advice from Charles de Gaulle on a trip to France in 1961. And uh, it's a little long, but it's rather fascinating. Remember, the French, like the British, were old players in this imperial game. Uh, they had just fought two unsuccessful wars against insurgencies in Indochina and Algeria. So now de Gaulle is saying to Kennedy, rather prophetically, it's possible to maintain influence if you don't put in troops. And then he adds at the bottom that point that if you give a government in a third world country too much money, uh, it becomes corrupt and it becomes unpopular. And I am sure that that insight will continue to resonate with some of you. Uh, so, instead, as you know, the strategy in Vietnam focused on trying to bolster the ZM government, the existing regime. Uh, Kennedy refused to let Southeast Asia become a primary problem. The only time that it was, was in the crisis of the ZM regime in the months just before Kennedy's death. He was much more focused on Berlin, on Cuba, on the Congo, on various other parts of the third world. And when all these arguments in his administration came to a climax on the 15th of November in an NSC meeting, he gave, I think, a rather brilliant short exposition on why this would be a terrible place to fight. Now, I realize that you're not going to be able to read that from start to finish right now. You can look at it later. That quote is excerpted uh, by Schulzinger on page 112, but I think you want to have the whole thing. Uh, what he is saying is the conflict in Vietnam is not clear because it's a guerrilla conflict. It's a long way away. We've given the government a lot of money, and they don't seem to be doing very much with it. Our allies in Europe won't give us any help on this, and it'll be awfully tough to explain to the American people. In other words, really a fine list of reasons why going in there wouldn't be a good idea. But the strategy of helping Ziem wasn't working in 1963. Uh, Ziem was clearly losing the support of the South Vietnamese people, or had lost it. Uh, he was also losing the war, although that was less clear to the American policymakers at that time. And thus, Kennedy was persuaded, uh, in the end, to allow for another preventive coup, if you will, in the hope that a new government would be more effective. Of course, it didn't turn out uh, that way. Now, there are a couple of more things I ought to mention before I leave Kennedy behind. One is the Cuban Missile Crisis. Let's go back to a map. Here, the United States, the whale in this great conflict, used classic Corbettian strategy to force the Soviets to remove the intermediate-range nuclear missiles that they had put in Cuba. We had the naval force to surround it, and the land force which we were preparing to invade it and occupy it. And that, in the end, left Khrushchev essentially no choice but to agree to withdraw the missiles. We could also back all this with the threat of general war, since it was now clear to everybody in 1962 that we had enormous strategic superiority. Um, this was a very close run thing. We only have learned relatively recently how dangerous all this was. We were quite close to invading Cuba. We might have done so. And if we had, Guantanamo immediately would have been hit by a tactical nuclear weapon, a Soviet tactical nuclear weapon, in Cuba, which was ready to go. 
In fact, the guy manning that weapon uh, has been interviewed by an American scholar. We did not know about those tactical nuclear weapons, and we didn't know how close we had come. But as it was, uh, Khrushchev, acknowledging our Corbettian superiority, uh, did pull out, and that was certainly a great triumph for American strategy uh, that you would be well advised to look into more carefully. Lastly, I must mention a rather scary uh, footnote to this whole issue of co covert action and CIA assassination plots. I mentioned that under Eisenhower, the CIA had enlisted several mafia chieftains to assassinate Fidel Castro, which they had not been able to do. Robert Kennedy, as Attorney General under JFK, immediately mounted the biggest attack by far that had ever been mounted on American organized crime an attack that extended to the same mob chieftains that had been hired to assassinate Castro. When Robert Kennedy found out that they had been hired to assassinate Castro, he was furious. He told the CIA to turn this off. The CIA told them that they had, but, and this was the subject of my last book that I spent most of the last decade researching, the CIA did not turn it off, but they allowed it to continue. And I concluded in that book that feeling double-crossed and under great pressure, those mob chieftains then decided to arrange the assassination of President Kennedy, which in fact they did, even though there's no doubt that Lee Harvey Oswald had pulled the trigger. Now there is a broader point here, and it's a point about covert action. When you embark on covert action, you are creating a zone of illegality. You are promoting illegality. It's the same thing that you are doing when, for instance, you outlaw certain drugs uh, or prostitution, which people are bound to engage in, but you are turning it into an